This is Pokemon Platinum with only the Bidoof line, let's do this. Rules are in the description. Starting out for base stats, this mono normal type has 59 HP, 45 attack, 40 defense and special defense, 35 special attack and 31 speed. It's a medium fast growth rate Pokemon like other regional rodents, but compared to the ones that came before it in the series, this one is unique because when it evolves into Beeberl, it gets the water typing. Evolution occurs at level 15, so I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be fully evolved by the time I'm facing Rourke. As we get into this run and fight the rival for the first time, I want to mention Bidoof's ability, which is simple. By the way, I had the choice between this or the ability Unaware, and I figured that simple would be a little bit more fun and also potentially better. Unaware essentially removes the enemy's stat changes from the battle, but simple means that I can stack my own stat changes significantly faster. With this ability, whenever Bidoof's stats are changed, this effect will be doubled. In Generation 4, this works kind of awkwardly. If you're at plus 1, it's just going to multiply your stat as if it was at plus 2, but you will still be at plus 1. However, in future Pokemon games starting in Generation 5, it will just go to plus 2 right away. The stats displayed in the bottom left are going to correctly update as they would in Pokemon Platinum. So you'll see my defense or attack stages go up by 1, but my stats will be recalculated as if the stage modifier is plus 2. Then, if I get to plus 2, it will be as if I'm at plus 4, and so on. By the way, if you go past plus 3, there is no additional bonuses, so it still does max out at the stat gains that you would gain from plus 6. However, I can do this in half the time. Now, the reason I decided to go for this is because late into the game, Bidoof learns Curse at level 45. When I evolve to Beaveril, this level is going to go up to 53, but I figured since this move is so good for setup, after all, watch any of my generation 2 videos if you want proof of that, I figured that I could leverage it to great effect with the ability simple. Now there is a downside here because lowering my speed is also going to be doubled, meaning that Beeberl is essentially going to move second against all of its targets. But I think that that can already be expected when you're utilizing the move curse. Also, once I arrive in Jubilife City, I can pick up the Quick Claw, which is going to be a fantastic held item to mitigate the negative effects of curse. As I leave the city, once again, Barry challenges me to a battle. This one's quite easy because Bidoof and most of the regional rodents are quite good in the early game. I think Game Freak's design philosophy around early game Pokemon is pretty clear. They want to provide them to you, they'll be useful for the first gym or two, and then their abilities will fall off significantly as the game progresses. They're essentially Pokemon that are meant to be replaced, but that's exactly what I won't be able to do today. Okay, so now let's talk about Rourke. Obviously, he is a rock type specialist and as a normal type Pokemon, my chances against him don't look particularly good. I'm going to fight all of the early game trainers to level Bidoof up as much as is possible. By the time I pass through Orberg Gate, it's level 12, almost level 13, and after defeating all the trainers in the mine, it is halfway to level 14. I'm also going to fight the trainers in the gym for some additional experience, and here I should talk about Bidoof's current moveset. Right now it has Return, which was a gift from the professor at the very start of the game. I've learned Rollout through Level Up, which can be paired with Defense Curl. This is a fantastic combo for the Bidoof line to use, especially when its ability is simple. I've kept Tackle around, but that's going to be the next move that I replace. The trainers in the gym bring Bidoof pretty close to level 15, so I decide to grind on some wild Pokemon in Orberg Gate. I'm collecting experience here because I want to catch HM users in this location as well, so I can combine these two tasks to save a little bit of time. Once Bidoof Bidoof reaches level 15, it evolves to Beeberl. And very conveniently, upon evolution, it has the chance to learn Water Gun, which of course I am going to put in the place of Tackle. With this same type attack bonus move that is super effective against Rock type Pokemon, I'm now ready to face Rourke. His lead is Geodude, and it's pretty weak. It also loves to set up Stealth Rock on turn 1, so I decided to go for 3 turns of Defense Curl to max out my defense stat. After that, I one-shot with Water Gun, of course the Onyx goes down to a single hit as well, and then he sends in his ace, Kranidos. As a mono rock type, it doesn't take 4 times damage from Water Gun, so it survives my hit and uses Headbutt. However, this move doesn't do enough damage, so I easily finish it off with my next hit and earn myself the first badge. 
Okay, I went through the evolution quickly because we needed to get into that battle. Now let's take some time and go through Beeberl's base stats. It has 79 HP, 85 attack, 60 defense, 55 special attack, 60 special defense, and 71 speed. This is a base stat total of 410, which is shared by Pokemon like Meg Cargo and Ponyta. Yeah, this thing is not particularly good. I think some of you will be having a similar thought around these colors for the stats. During the time frame that this video was pre produced in, Bulbapedia decided to change all of their colors, both the type colors as well as the base stat colors, so that they now reflect what Game Freak is using in the official Pokemon releases. When I woke up and saw the changes, like all of you, I was initially just completely disgusted. But you know, the longer I've taken to think about these colors, the more they really make sense, and I personally prefer the new colors, so in videos going forward that are filmed after the changes were made, I am going to be updating my own color schemes. I'll probably make a standalone video in the future talking about why these colors are so good and people should give them a chance, but this video is not the place for that. I did want to mention this discrepancy though because it's going to pop up at a lot of places during the video. Whenever we're screenshotting graphics from Bulbapedia, they will be using the new colors, but all of the filmed footage will be using the old colors. The next portion of the game is very straightforward, and I'm not going to gain any useful items or moves. So let's talk about B Beaverl's move pool while we have time. It learns Headbutt at level 18, Hyperfang at level 23, Yawn at 28, Amnesia at 33, and then Superpower at 48, and Curse at 53. Through TM and HM, it gets access to a wide variety of moves. Water Pulse, Ice Beam, Blizzard, Rain Dance, Thunderbolt, Thunder, Return, Dig, Shadow Ball, Shock Wave, Rest, just to make me happy, Charge Beam, which could be useful in the late game to boost my special attack, Thunder Wave, Stealth Rock, Grass Knot, and Substitute. Through HM, it gets access to pretty much everything Cut Surf, Strength, Rock Smash, Waterfall, and Rock Climb. In a game with 8 HMs, it's clear why this thing was used by most of us to traverse the overworld. Once I arrive at the Valley Windworks and fight my way through some Rocket Grunts, I then have to face Commander Mars. This fight is generally challenging because the Per Ugly can be very intimidating. However, I have Headbutt now, which does so much damage damage with an effective power of 105. It one-shots the Zubat and then does almost half damage to her ace. I take some damage from Scratch and Faint Attack, but it isn't enough to give Beeberl an issue. Heading north to Eterna Forest, I have to start thinking about what's coming next, and that's Gardenia the Grass-type specialist. As a result, I am going to fight every trainer I can to max out my experience gains. Inside the forest, I continue this philosophy, and it's really easy to train here because Cheryl heals your Pokémon after every battle. When I leave the forest, my Beeberl is level 23. There are three fishers on this route, so I'll fight them as well for some additional experience. And by the time I make it to the grass type gym, I'm level 24. There is a really annoying grass clock puzzle here, which always frustrates me. It takes so long, even when I am playing with a sped up game. Luckily for me, I don't have any problems against the grass type Pokemon, and with that, I am ready for the second gym leader. Gardenia's first Pokemon is Turtwig. This thing loves to set up with Sunny Day as well as Reflect. I wanted to get rid of it as soon as possible, and I figured Headbutt would do enough damage, but it doesn't, so I really should have used Hyper Fang. Unfortunately, she sets up Reflect and then heals her lead with a Super Potion before I take it back down to red health. Okay, a little bit frustrating. This allows the Grass type to use Razor Leaf, which does almost half to me before I finish her lead off and move on to the Cherim. Hyper Fang does almost nothing because of Reflect. While it does wear off and I knock her second Pokemon out on the next turn, her Roserade finishes Beeberl. That's my first reset. Okay, let's just use Hyper Fang right away, and oh, the Turtwig still survives? Okay, fine. It sets up Reflect. This is really frustrating. It's gonna hit me again, and this time Razor Leaf crits, so yeah, that's a second reset. Some indecision set in. I wanted to go and do some training, but then I decided against it, remembering the fact that Headbutt and Hyperfang have the chance to cause her Pokemon to flinch. If I can do that against the Turtwig, preventing it from getting Reflect, then I will deal more damage to her following two Pokemon, and maybe Beeberl has a chance in that case. I have two more losses against her because I'm using Hyperfang, after all it does more damage, but the flinch chance is only 10%. If I instead use Headbutt, I then have a 30% chance to flinch, I get it 
right away and knock the Turtwig out. Okay, this is perfect. Hyperfang then crits the Cherim, getting a one-shot, and that means Beaverl has green health for the Rose Raid. I continue using Hyperfang, it does more than half, and despite a Citrus Berry, I will still have enough damage. Rose Raid tries for Stun Spore, which misses, and that allows me to defeat Gardenia. Okay, that wasn't the most convincing result, and it does seem that Game Freak was trying to convince you that Beaverl shouldn't be on your team after this point. Or at least they were trying to tell you that you should have a fire type on your team. It's a good thing players had a lot of options for those. Next, I have to face Commander Jupiter in the Team Galactic building. I one-shot the Zubat. Next is Skuntank. It looks like Beaverl is going to three-hit this thing. Now, it does know Night Slash, which has a high critical hit rate and does decent damage, but it looks like it would have needed at least two crits to knock me out. With Team Galactic managed, I backtrack to the old Chateau, where I can pick up one rare candy, as well as the TM4 substitute. This is probably one of the best solo playthrough moves, and I'm anticipating that Beaverl is going to make some use of it in the future. Okay, as we head down Cycling Road and I continue my training, I just want to mention my Beaverl's nickname, which is Badetta. I asked my wife to nickname my Beaverl because I really couldn't think of anything, and this was the choice that she went with. I think in the future, I'm going to have to reevaluate asking her for names. After all, the last time I did, she gave me Jerry for Giratina. At level 28, I teach Yawn in the place of Headbutt because Return is now becoming similar in power. I continue fighting optional trainers all the way until Heart Home City because right now with my current set, the only option I have for damage against Fantina's Pokemon is Water Gun. That said, I think there are a few other ways that I can make this fight a little bit more consistent. Number one, I can equip a Chestoberry just in case the Haunter lands a Hypnosis, and I can also teach Beaverl Substitute in the place of Hyperfang. Will this be enough? Well, let's see. Fantina's lead Duskull loves to use Will-O-Wisp turn 1, so I'm going to set up with Substitute right away. Also, it has terrible offensive stats, so the chance that it breaks your decoy is very low. I take it out with two uses of Water Gun, and then she sends in her ace, Miss Magius. Water Gun is doing very little damage, but her AI is using Confuse Ray against me, which just fails when I have a Substitute in place. Eventually, it chooses Magical Leaf, which of course is super effective, breaking my Substitute right away. I attempt to re-establish it. it works works out, giving me one more turn where I use Yawn so that the Miss Magius falls asleep. Now I'm going to attack with Water Gun and hopefully be able to take it out, but of course she has healing items giving it time to wake up and strike back with one last Magical Leaf. Alright, I definitely could have played that fight better. Here's how. I will once again establish my substitute on the Duskull, then use Water Gun to knock it out, move on to the Miss Magius, where I'm going to use Yawn right away, putting it to sleep, and then I can re-establish my substitute when my health is high and use Water Gun to take it down. It does look like I'm fishing for a bit of luck though, because the Miss Magius is alternating between either Confuse Ray or Magical Leaf. If I'm establishing a substitute on the turn it goes for the grass move, then it's just going to break my sub right away, but if it uses Confuse Ray, then I get one more turn to get a move in like Yawn. I felt that this strategy was a little bit too inconsistent, so after my second reset, I decided to switch my game plan. If I use one rare candy, I can level Beaverl up to 33, where it can learn Amnesia in the place of Yawn. By doing this, I can set up my special defense covered by a substitute against the Duskull, which remember due to simple will be maxed out after only two turns. The AI is obviously aware of the fact that I am setting up my special defense because instead of sending in Miss Magius next, she chooses Haunter. Beaverl lucks out with a critical hit, one-shotting, and then she sends in her ace. Without Yawn, things against it are going to be slightly sketchier. That said, it's using a lot of Confuse Ray. When Magical Leaf finally hits, it breaks my substitute. I wanted to see with a new substitute if it would break it right away, and yes, it still is, which is frustrating. By the way, if you didn't know, your substitute uses your current defensive stats, so if you set up behind one, it is becoming tougher. When I can't survive one Magical Leaf with a substitute, I'm just going to have to take damage from this move, and unfortunately the Miss Magius crits, knocking Beaverl out. Alright, that was just bad luck, so without the critical hit from Magical Leaf, and with a lower damage roll apparently, my substitute survives. This 
This allows me to have it in place for the duration of this fight, finishing her ace off and earning myself the third badge. The rival outside of Hartholm City is next, and he sends in Staravia first, and now I'm realizing that Intimidate is going to be doubled by Simple. So while I am able to finish off his first Pokemon, I do take an Endeavor in the process, and then I have no chance against the following Grodel. In the next fight I try to play around this with Substitute, and while it does get me to the Grodel and give me the ability to survive one hit, I just can't do enough damage to this thing. It survives with a sliver and then polishes my water type off. It took one more similar loss before I finally realized that I need to go and do some additional training. There are some trainers that I skipped, like this guy with fighting types, but I also didn't explore Wayward Cave, where there is another rare candy. This is also the location where you pick up the TM for Earthquake, and strangely, Beaverall can't learn this move. It really seems like it should. I battle wild Pokemon, leveling up to 35, and then I use two rare candies to bring Beaverall up to level 37. I have now used three rare candies in this playthrough, and I'm going to talk about my decision to do that after we watch the rival battle. I establish my substitute, Staravia sets up double team, and then I go for Water Gun, which hits, but unfortunately it misses, Staravia breaks my substitute with Endeavor, and then I try to re-establish substitute, but it just breaks it again. I think what I might need to do to win this fight is set up Amnesia like I did against Fantina. Without a substitute or special defense boost, things seem hopeless against the Grottle, but then Bibril critical hits with Return and One-Shots. Okay, I guess. Return continues its spree one-shotting the Bleasel, and then I have Water Gun for the Ponyta. So yeah, that's a win. I guess as promised, let's talk about rare candies. In my Heatran video, I counted every single rare candy you can obtain in these solo challenges, and there are a total of 20 in Pokemon Platinum. The effect this has on the run is that you usually spam about 15 to 16 of them later on into the playthrough, going up to level 80, and then you crush the Elite Four. It doesn't make an exciting finish to the videos, but it also might be leaving a lot of time on the table. Because if I can make the Elite Four more challenging, I know that I'm going through at the minimum possible level. This will save both real time and game time, and that of course is my goal with these playthroughs. With this knowledge, I can strategically play using rare candies as soon as I run into problems. I don't want to go back and do too much extra training, I should also fight as few optional trainers as is possible. There is one caveat here, which is the rare candies are only available after you defeat Gardenia, so there's no possibility to cut training from that portion of the game. In the future, to increase difficulty and interest, I'm going to include the League rematches in my Pokemon Platinum videos, but for now I want to explore this setup and see if I can use my rare candies more intelligently to finish the game with a lower time and level. On Route 215, I take some time to pick up the Fist Plate, this might be useful later on in combination with Super Power, and then I grab the Shockwave TM. After that, I have to face Ace Trainer Dennis, who is quite scary actually, his Drift Bloom has caused problems in the past. Luckily for Bieberl, no issues today. The next gym leader is Maylene, so I'm gonna prepare for her by doing a bunch of additional training south of Veilstone City. This leads me to Pastoria City where I can grab an additional rare candy in the marsh, and then I can use the move reminder to teach Defense Curl in the place of Amnesia. And I also get another rare candy just west of the city. Now I have to do a little bit of backtracking, but I figured that it would be worth it. Inside the game corner I'm gonna spend my money and buy a Silk Scarf, which will boost the power of return by 20%. This is absolutely fantastic, and now its effective power is 169. Nice. With that, I think I have what I need to take on Maylene. Her first Pokemon is Metatite, I use Substitute, and it chooses Rock Tomb, which does not do enough damage to clear my defenses. As a result, I'm going to be able to set up Defense Curl at least once before re-establishing my Substitute. This could give me a second Defense Curl if I really wanted it, but I decided to go for a Return and finish her lead off. I say no to learning Super Fang, this move really isn't that useful. Machoke is next, I one-shot with Return because this move is becoming very powerful, and then I have to go up against a Lucario. In this situation, although Return is resisted, it will still deal more damage than Water Gun. That's because it has a higher effective power, as well as the fact that my attack stat is far in excess of my special attack. I do a little bit more than half to the Steel type, and while it does heal itself with Drain Punch, this is not enough to take it out of KO range, so I've earned myself the fourth badge. 
I clear up the galactic grunts in the warehouse and then I use Fly to head back to Pastoria City where the rival is waiting for me outside of Crasher Wake's gym. Apparently for Beebril, he is just going to be a challenge in every single location because of how annoying the Staravia's Intimidate is, but this is something I did to myself. And uh, I'm not joking here, I have one loss, I come back into the fight and crit the Grotal for a second time. That is ridiculous. And hopefully I can take some of that luck with me into the gym, because Crasher Wake has been one of the most challenging trainers in these runs. For this battle, I have taught my Beeberl Shockwave, because I know the Gyarados is going to hit me with Intimidate right away. Also, I want 4 times damage against it, but this isn't enough to one-shot. Are you kidding me? That's how bad Beeberl's special attack is? <sighs> I finish it off after he uses a Hyper Potion, and then he sends in his Float Soul. I felt obligated to continue using a special attack. It does more than half, but not enough to take it out of KO range after its Citrus Berry. This gives him time to use a Hyper Potion, me out further, dealing damage until Beeberl has three hit points left. Of course, this is not enough to defeat the bulky Quagsire. Here's the thing, I have recently learned that I can rebuy the substitute TM in the game corner if I have need for it later in a run. So I can replace substitute with Shockwave and keep Defense Curl so that I can set up, making moves like Crunch and Bite deal significantly less damage. But I didn't need this planning because I crit the Gyarados with Shockwave, okay? So I guess we're just attacking, I'm not going to set up against the Floatzel. I get better damage ranges here again, knocking it out in only two hits. And then against Quagsire, I'm just barely not doing enough damage to two-shot once again. So that is a second loss to Crasher Wake. In the third battle, things are going to go according to plan. First, the Gyarados goes down to red health. I know he's going to use a Hyper Potion, so then I use one turn of Defense Curl, get a better damage roll on the next turn, and knock it out. With my defenses established, I figured I would have enough time in the battle to finish off both the Floatzel and the Quagsire, but it ends up not being the case because the Quagsire crits me with Mud Shot. Are you kidding? Okay, Beeberl has a different option against his final Pokemon. I can teach Grass Knot in the place of Defense Curl, so I have four times damage against it. Shockwave doesn't one-hit the Gyarados, but as long as I keep attacking, it's going to go down. Floatzel's next. It looks like I am consistently getting two-shot ranges on this thing now, which is great, and that leads to his final Pokemon Quagsire, which of course faints to Grass Knot. In Celastic Town, after taking a quick victory over Cyrus, I get the TM for Surf, which is a fantastic same type attack bonus move for Beeberl. That said, after I get a few more badges and gain access to the Waterfall HM, then that will be the better option for Beeberl because it deals physical damage. And then just before Candelave City when facing a trainer, I have the chance to learn the move Superpower. I figure this will be useful, so let's teach it now. Also, before I face the rival, I'm going to use Rare Candies because he's been problematic in the past, and I want to give myself the best possible chance. This brings Beeberl up to level 53, where it can finally learn Curse in the place of Grass Knot. My set is now Return, Surf, Superpower, and Curse, and I'm hoping that it's going to give me what I need to beat the rival on my first attempt. He leads with Staraptor, of course, so Intimidate right away. That said, this thing loves to set up its evasion with Double Team, so I went for Curse to boost my attack. After getting my attack to plus one, I one-shot with Return, and then he sends in Heracross. Okay, this thing does no Brick Break, but I should be able to survive with my boosted defense. Ah, unless it gets a critical hit, the enemy has gotten way too many of these in this run. Okay, let's try that again. I'm going to set up to plus one. Then the Heracross does very little damage with Brick Break, and I knock it out with Return. Torterra is next, but with my raised attack stat, Return finishes it, and from there, I clean up his Floatzel and Rapidash. It's time to face Byron. He leads with Magneton, and it does love to use Metal Sound, which is not going to pair well with my simple nature. I go for Curse to raise my attack, but then the Magneton outspeeds, hitting with Thunderbolt, and of course that one-shots Beeberl. So the right choice here is to use Superpower on turn 1 to finish off the Magneton. This does lower my attack and defense, but I can use Surf against the Steelix. After all, it has lower special defense. I get the one-shot and then Bastiodon comes out. It's pretty tanky overall, but with super effective special damage, Beeberl still is able to take the win. I journey north to Snowpoint City, collecting rare candies on the way, and like an Emerald video where there's very little to say between major battles, let's go right into the battle against Candace. 
Sneeze. Return one shots the lead Sneasel, she sends in a Bomb of Snow, which barely survives, dealing some damage. Then she uses a Hyper Potion, and it survives another hit, so I'm taking damage from Hail. Pyloswine is next. I go for Super Power, finishing it in one hit, but then Surf can't do nearly enough damage to the Frostlass, and because of all of the chip damage, as well as its Psychics, my Beaveril faints. If I set up once against the Sneasel, then I can one-shot the following Obama Snow using Return, and I was also hoping to use Return against the Pyloswine, but instead she sends in Frostlass next. Surf does a little bit more than half, it heals, and then I just keep missing, because this thing's ability is Snow Cloak. As a result, I have a loss. I tried again with the exact same strategy, and as is on theme for this video, I get a critical hit against the Frostlass, knocking it out in only one turn. Because of that, I can one-shot the Pyloswine and earn myself the seventh badge. I want to take a moment now not to discuss these ridiculous crits which keep happening from either me or the enemy, but instead to discuss just how tricky simple is to play around. In this case, it ironically feels very complex. What I'm learning from this playthrough is that Unaware probably would have given me better first playthrough results, but Simple will likely lead better follow-up attempt results. That's because I will know all the locations to use rare candies, and exactly how to leverage moves like Defense Curl, Amnesia, as well as Curse. The next battle against Cyrus is a good way for me to illustrate how Beebril is more fragile utilizing Simple. In this case, when it gets hit by Screech, even after a Curse, its defense stat is so low that when Honchkrow goes for Drill Peck, it takes me all the way down to 9 hit points. I'm lucky to be able to win this battle on my first attempt. At the top of Mount Coronet, I face the double battle against the two commanders. This one's pretty easy, and with that, I have to face Cyrus again in the Distortion world. Now, this is one of the most difficult battles in a Platinum solo run. Knowing that, I typically want to use my rare candies here, and I did open my bag and consider using using 9 of them. That said, I would only be level 69, and I have a decent amount of experience that would be lost. In order to save it, I am going to have to try this battle at level 62. Houndoom is first and Surf one-shots. Next, he sends in Gyarados. I counter its Intimidate by using Curse a single time. I figured with my attack stat restored, I would be able to get the one-shot on the Gyarados. After all, I'm level 62 and he's level 46. But the damage just isn't quite there. That leads to another Earthquake before I knock the Serpent out and move on to Haunch Crow. This thing has Night Slash. Luckily, it doesn't get a critical hit, but it takes me to red health, and I am not going to be able to defeat two more Pokemon with my speed stat completely destroyed. I tried again taking my time against the Gyarados to set up to plus one attack. This way my return will get the one shot and he won't use a potion. However, then Crobat comes out using Toxic, which ends up being really annoying because I'm taking a little bit of damage every turn. In combination with Weavile using Fake Out, I have a status condition incurred loss. I wanted to set up on the Houndoom, but this is a bad idea because then it just burns me with Will-O-Wisp. This is a moment where I really wish I had gone back and rebought Substitute. I realize what my problem was in the next battle after his Haunch Crow defeats me. If I have some form of passive recovery throughout the entire battle, I should have enough health to survive it. So, by utilizing the Shell Bell, which I picked up back in Heart Home City, I can recover a small amount of health each time I deal damage, and by doing so, defeat Cyrus. With the plotline taken care of, I run away from Giratina and make my way towards Sunny Shore City. As is the case in most of these Platinum playthroughs, I arrive at Volkner extremely overleveled. I'm able to one-shot all of his Pokémon with Return, with the exception of Luxray. It just barely survives, but his electric moves aren't doing very much damage. With the gym challenge behind me, Jasmine gifts me the HM for Waterfall. I backtrack to Candelave City to use the Move Deleter to get rid of Surf so that I can teach this physical move in its place. Now I have Return, Waterfall, and Super Power, all of which receive boosts when I utilize Curse. Also, it's nice having physical moves at this point in the game because I have to defeat the legendary Blissey Trainer. Despite using Rare Candies early in the run, I probably should have used more against Cyrus. That leads me to the case here, where I'm going up against the rival at either level 68 or level 80. I tried at the lower level and no, this isn't a good idea. So I'll spend all my rare candies now and hopefully crush the rival. He has been very problematic throughout this entire playthrough. There wasn't a single battle after the initial two where I beat him on my first attempt. Even at level 80, the bad news continues. I misplay here, setting up too much with curse and I don't have enough health for the remainder of the fight. Now I say that that was a bad play because it's obvious that it was. I'm so overleveled, I only need to restore 
restore my attack stat after the intimidate, if that. From here I just spam return, finish his team off, and with that I have gained access to the Elite Four. Aaron is first, and Aaron has not really been a challenge yet, so yeah, I'm just gonna win. I don't even set up in this fight, instead just prioritizing return. The scissor does survive. By the way, I'm really looking forward to re-ranking this thing in Generation 2 at some point during this year. It goes down, last is Drapion, but return does enough damage. Next is Bertha, and she is definitely the best Elite 4 member in this game. I thought that I would maybe need one setup with Curse, but I wanted to try the fight just spamming Waterfall to see how it would go, and in this case I take a first attempt victory and move on to Flint, who uh, yeah, I'm a water type, so keep using Waterfall and he's going to lose. This might be the fastest sweep through the Platinum League so far. Next is Lucian. I can use Return on most of his Pokemon with the exception of the Bronzong, but that thing isn't very good offensively anyways. It tries Calm Mind on the first turn giving me two hits, and with that I have arrived at Cynthia. Spiritomb is first. This is a great Pokemon to set up against because its offensive stats are quite low. It's choosing Dark Pulse, which is a special move, unfortunately, so every time I go for Curse, it is not improving my defenses. I'm holding the Shell Bell so that I have some form of recovery because I've chosen not to use Rest in this run. Unfortunately, the Dark move flinches me once when I wanted to attack, and I'm at low red health by the time I'm moving on to her remaining team members. She's prioritizing Roserade second. That's very rare. This thing is usually the last Pokemon she sends in. Of course, it's able to use Energy Ball, and so I take a loss to the champion. Maybe this is not going to be as straightforward as I once thought. Let's try with only one setup from Curse, and then knock the Spiritomb out with Waterfall. Next is Roserade. It hits with Energy Ball, which does so much damage. And while I am able to proceed past it, the Lucario that's next uses Aura Sphere, giving me a second loss. Maybe the answer is not using Curse at all, and I have been thinking about this playthrough in the completely wrong way. It appears to be the case. I take out the Spiritomb, as well as the Roserade, moving on to the Lucario, but it survives Waterfall, attacking with Aura Sphere. She uses a potion, but luckily that does not give it another attack. Togekiss comes out next. I go for Return, doing more than half, but this flying type knows Aura Sphere, which takes Beeberl down to red health. But I am not through her team yet because she still has the Garchomp and my Lodic. She chooses the Dragon type first. I go for Return, which doesn't do nearly enough damage, and that is a third loss. Cynthia, where have you been all of this time? I think this is what most viewers were expecting when I started my Platinum series. It was at least what I was expecting. I tried one more time utilizing Curse, but this really is not the correct choice. What I'm going to need to do is completely revamp Beeberl's moveset. I picked up the TM for Ice Beam earlier in the run, so let's teach this so I have 4 times damage against the Garchomp. It's also going to be decent against the Roserade as well as the Togekiss, so if I can boost Ice Beam's power, it might be very useful. Teaching Charge Beam in the place of Super Power is a good way to do this. Then against the Spiritomb, I can spam the Electric type move, which has a 70% chance of raising my special attack. I get it turn 1 and use Waterfall for the KO. Okay, now I can Ice Beam the Roserade, Waterfall the Lucario to knock it out over 2 turns. It does does do a lot of damage if I haven't set up with Curse though, but the Togekiss as well as the Garchomp that follow are both free because I have the Shell Bell. That means my Beeberl has made it to the final Pokemon in the game, it's her Milotic. Charge Beam of course is super effective here, and it does more than half. That's great. Also, it boosts my special attack a little bit, but my Lodic uses Mirror Coat, and if you didn't know, this move pays back all of the special damage the Pokemon just received, multiplied by two. I guess I have to one-shot the Milotic so that it can't do this, or I have to use Return. I make it back to her final Pokemon with plus two. I knew that this wouldn't get the KO, but I didn't know why the AI would choose Mirror Coat. Does it do this when it sees that my special attack is higher? If anyone has an answer, please let me know in the comments. I try Charge Beam, but no, Mirror Coat happens again, so that's another loss. I really need my special attack to get boosted to like plus 3 or plus 4. In this case, I can use Charge Beam to continue attacking against the Lucario because she is going to heal it once. This gives me the boosts I need to get to plus 4. From there, I sweep her team back to the Milotic, continue using the Electric move, and one shot.
Bieberall clocks in with a final time of 2 hours 52 minutes and 49 seconds, with 30 resets at level 83, with a game time of 7 hours and 23 minutes. It's fair to say that this was a very bumpy playthrough, however, in context of the other results I have received, Bieberall did an amazing job. If we compare its time to Heatran, the Legendary was less than 10 minutes faster, and Bieberall was only 3.5 minutes slower than Star Raptor. Granted, I had 30 resets in this playthrough and Star Raptor only had 8. Also, the best time I have in Platinum is 2 hours 20 minutes and 50 seconds that I got with Giratina. Bieberall is 32 minutes slower than that, but that's not a huge margin when we're comparing an amazing legendary to an early game rodent. Plus, I think if I came back to this playthrough, I could improve its results a lot more than I could with a Pokemon like Giratina, Heatran, or Star Raptor. This run was just so complex, especially because of my ability. I do think one way to improve Beaverall's results is just using rare candies right before every rival battle to ensure that I don't have resets there. Knowing Beaverall's final moveset and the fact that it has to rely on Ice Beam and Charge Beam would save time, and I also could equip the Zap Plate to improve Charge Beam's damage against the Milotic. I also think there would be a big advantage to having a substitute TM available for the final battle. Both Return and Waterfall were completely useless by the time I got to Cynthia. While I couldn't unlearn the HM move, Return definitely could go. So with his results today, Bieberal outperforms Lop Honey as well as Cresselia, earning itself the top spot in the B tier. I'm just going to quickly switch over to the yellow tier list and show you the results that Raticate got in that game, yeah, it appears that early game rodents are actually decent for solo runs. This has got me really looking forward to trying a Pokemon like Furret in Generation 2. And I'm actually going to do that run today because behind the scenes my supporters and I are doing a little event where we're all playing through Generation 2 with Furret. If you're curious about these events, join the channel with the button below or consider supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate everyone who already does, so thank you so much, it means the world to me. We are going to continue on the theme of of early game Pokemon next week when we head back to Pokemon Yellow to see how Pidgey does. If you've been missing Generation 1 on the channel, I have good news for you because the week following that, we are going to be doing Spearow. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in the next video.